Hello, Mel. Hey, Mel. <laughs> That was uh, that cut short your conversation. Sorry about that. We were talking about the grover that he got uh, murdered at Clovelly in 1980, 2001. And we had to put oh, yeah. Okay. It's actually news whilst you're talking there, you're dropping out. So we just might need to sort out what happened there before we start. So Mel was okay when, we, when she was talking. It's, We've got the microphone in the same spot. Yeah. Okay. We'll see how we go. We'll see how we go. And we've got all the members. Uh, I've, got, I've got a quorum. Yes, I've got a quorum. Excellent. Well, we might get underway then. Um, so uh, I welcome uh, Minister Pavey, uh, Emma Solomon and Dan Connor to the hearing today uh, into the regulation, uh, very long title regulation. So I'm not going to go over that again. Um, but so we'll start off by taking, now does Mel have to give an oath? No, so Minister, Minister, you don't have to give an oath because you take the oath, you've already done so. Um, but if I could start with uh, Emma, if you could give your name, your position title, and then swear either the oath or the affirmation. I'll swear, yeah. But I don't have it in front of me. Do you, do you have it? How about, how about if you give us your name and title and, and then I'll, I'll read it. No. Out and we, can... we can see it. Turn it around. Show it. I oh, know. <laughs> Okay, so name and title. Um, I, Emma Solomon, Executive Director, Planning and Policy And uh, so if you could just, if you could just quote after me. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. I solemnly, sincerely, truly declare and affirm. That the evidence now about to be given by me. Show me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah, you keep fading out, fading oh. out there. Show me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That was excellent. <laughs> we got that one. Okay, uh, Dan, same thing. Uh, your name and title, and then uh, the oath of affirmation. Thanks, Vic. Um, so, Dan Connor, um, Director of Healthy Club. Project delivery and deep high water. And were you oh, taking oath. the affirmation or the oath? Oh, either one's fine. Oath, please. The oath. <laughs> I just repeat after me. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a short opening statement? I would. Um, thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, I haven't been watching the proceedings all day today, but uh, I do want to respond uh, to the yeah. um, considering the stress that farmers, irrigators, uh, and all across this as well, particularly in the south. We had allocations open yesterday on the Murray. At this point, there's no general security. We are hopeful that the Bureau of Meteorology's prediction for good rains in July and August will be accurate. Um, and uh, it is something that I've raised in the House. And this idea of setting one valley up against another valley is something that I've raised in the House. A couple of points I want to pick up on. Contrary to earlier claims in that evidence of about 900 gigalitres of floodplain harvesting over one week into February, um, the, the rain covered an area of only up to 500 gigalitres of storage. And I like to hear how you fit an extra 400 gigalitres into these storages, especially as there is only a maximum possible take per day of 50 gigalitres. Furthermore, the New South Wales half of the northern area, there is only 1,450 gigalitres on farm storage in the northern basin of New South Wales. That's 2,750 gigalitres of water, which cannot be stored if these dams are full. I'm just talking to the figures that were quoted by Mr. Brooks. Also, Mr. Brooks's lawyer cannot remember an article he ghost edited for The Guardian in May. He cannot remember this, how he can understand uh, the law is beyond me because an article that he edited was forwarded to me before the publication in The, uh, in the Guardian. And contrary to claims from Mr. Brooks and Mr. Hare, this regulation did not approve unauthorised works built after the 3rd of July 2008. 
simple fact that need to be put on the record to stop the conspiracy theories and to stop this pitting of one farmer against another. As you'd recall, um, Mr. Veach, as a, as a resident of southern New South Wales, this has been a VEX issue, uh, floodplain harvesting regulation. Uh, your, your party in government tried to deal with it in 2008. It's been on our books since 2013. So we have done a good job in putting this regulation in place. And for the first time ever, we had a floodplain uh, embargo on this first flush event in February. And whilst there's a lot of claims and counterclaims being put around it, and the one that particularly disturbed me was from Mr. Brooks, where he said, I authorised the lifting of the embargo. I didn't. It wasn't my job to do that. I don't have the power to do that. What he is doing is undermining the work of professional public servants who made the decisions. And I'm very pleased to report that we'll have uh, the independent analysis of that event, an important event for improved government policy. We'll have um, that report to us in the next couple of weeks, um, hopefully by at the very least the 16th of July, and we'll be able to release that draft report for people to look at and see the facts. And as you know, I've given substantial evidence on this during budget estimates. Um, and I'm, I'm, I know um, that the independent report will come out showing that there are things that we need to learn around communication, um, but it was a good event in terms of good water policy for New South Wales. Uh, so I think it's probably best if we just get into the questions now. It's a complicated area of policy. I'm really pleased um, to have uh, two you know, really good public servants beside me here today. Uh, we've got Emma and we've got Emma Solomon and Dan O'Connor who've been very much instrumental in getting um, the arrangements in place uh, for a policy that is going to at first deal with the Northern Basin. Um, but, and, and I know that Queensland is still working through their policies. So I mean, some questions, um, you know, need to be directed to Queensland in terms of, you know, what they didn't, they didn't have an embargo on the floodplain harvesting like us. There was, you know, quite a bit of water taken before it got to New South Wales. But the fact that there are 500 gigalitres sitting in the Menindee Lakes is evidence that it worked. Um, we are in a stressful period, as I pointed out at the beginning of my testimony. There's a lot of um, anxiety because of the general security allocations. My security allocations, for the most part, are, are being delivered. Um, but I think, you know, let's be productive with our time this afternoon. Okay. Thanks, Minister. Now, just for the committee's uh, information, so the, I've got uh, Robert Borzak, Justin Field and then Sam Faraway. I just have one quick question before I go into uh, to, uh, that sequence of questions. Uh, Minister, you mentioned the, your, the independent review that you would put in place. Just what is the timetable for that to deliver its report? Um, I'm hoping that um, we'll have 16th of July. Um, we'll be we'll go through our processes by then. I haven't yet seen it, um, Mr Chair. But Emma, you might give some more details about the processes. So just trying to, is that, how's that to Yeah, yeah, if you can lean forward, because yeah, it's been problematic. Um, so uh, in mid-July, I understand that the independent, independent review released their draft report for public consultation, for a period of public consultation, and then they'll take those views and put them into place. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's just not working. We, we, um, can we? Um, I think Emma might need to move the microphone in front of her when she's speaking. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, we can yeah so, just, so just so you know, Minister, for the, just in the room there, it works when you're speaking, Minister, but for Emma, it just seems to cut right out and then gets really scratchy and no one can really hear. So um, just not quite sure. So Emma, do you just want to have a go? Do you just want to continue on from the point where you said that there would uh, mid-July um, and then out for public comment? Uh, so it will be out for public consultation from mid-July, and then the panel will take those submissions into consideration and will release the final report, I understand, in September. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll now go to questions from uh, Robert Borzak first, and then Justin Field. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mick. Um, yeah, welcome, Minister. 
Minister, you said in response to Helen Dalton's questions in the House on the 18th of June that floodplain harvesting was completely legal. In fact, I think you said it two or three times. Uh, has the Solicitor General provided you with advice to indicate floodplain harvesting is, le is legal? My advice came from uh, information and advice I've given by my agency, which uh, relates to the 1912 Water Act. Any written advice from the uh, the uh, any legal advice in relation to that from the Crown Solicitor? Uh, the information I received was agency advice showing that floodplain harvesting uh, was considered uh, uh, a process that was part of the 1912 Water Act. Okay, so then does the agency have it? Agency have what? Legal advice from the Crown Solicitors that is completely legal. I, 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 can, I can direct that to the agency. Yep. Thanks for your question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yep. No worries. So um, I, I think uh, just to provide some context as well, so floodplain harvestings, um, the, the structures that are involved, the leg levees, the storages, all, all of those things have required approval under the Water Act as uh, Part 8 approvals. They're now known as flood work approvals under our new legislation. Those structures have required approval since 1983. Um, and they still require approval now. So the, the regulation that's being put in place doesn't change that in relation to flood work approval. So I wanted to provide that clarity up front first. Um, secondarily to that, there's um, the, the limits that have been set up in our water sharing plans and under the basin plan. So these are legal limits for all types of diversions. They include floodplain harvesting in those diversions. So the diversions that were originally set up under the CAP, so the Ministerial Council CAP that came, uh, was first agreed to in uh, 95 and then sort of came into effect from 97 includes floodplain harvesting those as well. So we've in the policy settings um, right from you know under the Water Act through the Water Management Act we've 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 recognised the structures we've recognised the volumes that those structures are able to take and we've foreshadowed since 2013 as part of government policy that we needed these transitional regulations in place to provide that level of clarity um, around. Um, uh, the works themselves and, and the need for licences in the interim period since the licences came into effect. So I just want to provide that sort of context and background information about the, the structures and, and certainly the water type volumes associated with flood plain harvesting as well. Background. So uh, in relation to my question, you don't have hold any Crown solicitor's advice to that effect? We can't answer that question. Well, I think you can answer ask you whether you had at such okay, advice. I, That's not legal professional privilege, I'm afraid. Can I just I'm not ask you what the advice here. is? I'm asking you whether you've got it. Can I just intervene here because Robert, you dropped out as well, and so did uh, so did Emma. So we only got bits and pieces from both. So uh, Robert, I'll get you to re-ask your question, and then we'll go to Emma. Yeah, my my question was about the legal professional. Uh, opinion from the Crown Solicitor and the answer I got, which I heard at this end, was that you couldn't answer because of legal professional uh, privilege. Now, I'm not asking you what's in the document. That may well be privileged. I'm asking you whether you have such a document. Sorry, Emma, we didn't get any of that. Uh, we'll take that question on notice. All right, I don't, honestly don't see what's so difficult about that, but anyway. All right, um, the Water Management Act 2000 provides for floodplain harvesting access licence. How many licences have been issued under the Act? And have you got an answer on that? Yeah, there aren't any at the moment, Robert. So this is a process through implementing the floodplain harvesting policy to create those licences, but at the moment there are no licences for floodplain harvesting across the state. Well, why wouldn't you have them licensed by now? So the, the process of licensing, it's, it's a, you know, this is really um, ambitious, complex water reform. I think seven years is a long time, and I'm not taking away from that since 2013 to, to 2020, but I did want to put it in context in relation to other large reforms that New South Wales has delivered over time and then talk to you a little bit about what we have been doing under the project to give you some background. So, for example, 
The process of developing regulated river water sharing plans, one of our other big reform projects, took six years to de develop. So those plans, the planning process is starting in 1998 and finished in 2004. Um, Non-urban water metering framework, as you'd be aware, we're just in the process of starting to implement that at the moment. There was a, a some 10 year process in developing the arrangements around water metering to bring that into effect. So in, in relative terms, what we're trying to achieve in floodplain harvesting, we've got an action plan the minister announced uh, towards the end of last year, which outlines the process and timeframes for bringing licenses into effect by 30 June, 2021 in the Northern Basin. In relative terms, th this is pretty similar to other large water reform projects. And as I stressed, this is complex, it's clearly contentious, um, and, it's a, and it's a really ambitious reform. Some of the things we've done in the last six years, we've had to re models, we've declared new floodplain, uh, new floodplains, we've developed and commenced three new floodplain management plans in the Northern Basin with the, the, the next two management plans um, currently in the final stage of approval um, as we speak. We've mapped and recorded all the works capable of floodplain harvesting across the Northern Basin, no need to be, and a three or four year extensive on ground mapping project um, to get to get to there. And I think it's just important yep. here to point out um, that our agencies have expended oh, you know enormous um, taxpayer resources into that process, something like 50 million. And we've only done the north. We haven't done that work yet in the south. So uh, there was some mixed messaging um, from the evidence earlier from Mr Brooks and Mr. Hare, that flood, I think Mr. Brooks said at the beginning that floodplain harvesting doesn't take place in the south. And then he sort of um, gave a different response later. Um, you know, let's be clear: this is about measuring floodplain harvesting in the north, but it also does happen in the south, and this is something governments are going to have to deal with as well. Thank you, Robert. Um, I've just been muted. Um, under what floodplain, uh, under what law is floodplain harvesting legal? Which sections of the Water Act 1912 allows for unlicensed floodplain harvesting? So the Water Act 1912 itself, um, so what the Water Act 1912 deals with licensing from rivers and creeks in terms of the take of water and aquifer systems. It provides for the construction of works on floodplains through part eight of the the Water Act, so Water Act's now, now repealed and that those arrangements are now dealt with under the Water Management Act with flood work approval. Um, the volume um, has been put in place under our Water Management Act, as, as I said before, for our water sharing plans and those same water sharing plan limits are reflected in the lesson plan. So the volume uh, are there, but there's a licensing process yet to come, Robert. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, I'm a sort of, I don't know whether that actually answers the question. Um, are you saying that under the 1912 Act, floodplain the harvesting did not have to be licensed? Uh, and therefore, the was legal. Yeah, the, 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 the services themselves had to be licensed on the floodplain, but the take of water wasn't licensed under the Water Act 1912. But at that same time, recognised in cap agreements uh, under you know, Ministerial Council cap agreements in '95, and then later brought into the Water Management Act framework through our water sharing plan. Why is the New South Wales government breaching their own water floodplain harvesting policy of 2013, which states, and I quote, all floodplain harvesting activities will require a water supply, work approval, and floodplain harvesting access licence authorised under the Water Management Act 2000? Why have you not properly implemented that policy in seven years? I mean, as we've said, it's a, a mammoth task. It's complicated. Not to not to say that you know seven years is a reasonable time frame. As I pointed out at the beginning, Labor started this process in two thousand and eight. But we are, you know, that is why it's so frustrating to hear so much negativity about our first ever floodplain harvest, harvesting embargo during that first flush in February. Um, you know, we are measuring it and we are managing it, um, and we have moved a long way forward, but. This north versus south argument that um, that people like Mr. Brooks and, and Mr. Hare are, are pushing, as if you know they'd have had four thousand gigalitres of water um, after that event. I mean, it, it's just it's bonkers stuff, and it's setting communities against communities. 
and you know there is floodplain harvesting that happens in the south as well and uh -oh. at some point for this type yep. of pressure we're going to have to be able to manage and 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 and, and license and ensure that that is being conducted as well yep. robert minister i wouldn't say i wouldn't use the terminology bonkers uh uh, the reality is it's not them against us. The reality is the questioning is being put to you because we're trying to achieve some sort of clarity. Uh, we're tr they, are, they are trying to understand why uh, large volumes of water haven't arrived uh, to their part of the river uh, from an unregulated system further up the river. Uh, why has it taken this government nine years uh, to not get this finalised and now talking about another year uh, when there is no promise, or sorry, there is a promise, but there's no actuality that it be, can be done in the in the next 12 months. And now you're looking for a reg that has no sunset clause that forces you to get it done in that period of time. The reality is, Mr. Borzak, is 500 gigalitres sitting in Manistee. That shows that the water went down the system. Uh, and some systems suggestion that they should, there should have been 4,000 gigalitres get to the south, that they could have got some allocation. But that's what um, I referred to. So, and this is what creates, you know, water policy is difficult. It is really hard. And it's very easy to create conspiracy theories of wrong facts of information. You know, there was a criticism from Mr. Brooks that we spent $17 million on LIDAR technology that can actually ascertain the amount of water in an off-farm storage or in a you know in a, a dam storage i mean mr mr brooks tried to suggest to you that all the dams were full because he took a plane up and he could see how much water was there i mean let's think about that Let, let's talk that through in an honest way you could take a plane up look down and have a look at a swimming pool you could say that's full but there might only be five millimeters of water in the bottom of that swimming pool so this is what i'm talking about integrity Process, integrity in the facts and the information that goes out to the community so we don't set farmer against farmer. Acknowledge that we are now in a strong place, stronger than we've ever before, being able to manage, license, uh, and regulate floodplain harvesting. And it's not easy, and I'm not defending the time that it's taken either side of the political fence to do it, but we're doing it. You right, Robert? No, you're on, you're on mute, Robert. Yeah, I, well, someone keeps switching me muted. Um, in the same context as you're criticising him, uh, obviously they can criticise you. Uh, the reality is that in the in their part of the base, on the southern basin, they are, even after these massive flood events, still on 0% allocation. Now, how can you not, how can you not expect them to be critical of you and what you're doing and why it's taking so long? Because sadly, Hume and Dartmouth haven't filled. That is where the water comes for the south. I wish that those dams were full. I wish Chaffee was full. I wish Dungowan was full. I wish Wyangla was full. I wish Burundon was full. But they're not. There's been magnificent rains that have fallen in the western part of New South Wales. I'm sure Mr. McClure's dams that he has on his property out there that aren't uh, caught up in a 10% harvestable, right, are, are plentiful. And we've finally got water coming out of Tural Station after, you know, sitting there in years when that water was meant to come back into the Darling. We've done good work, but the allocations, general security allocations, are dependent on what the levels in the dams feeding that system are. Murray, Murrumbidgee has got 10% allocation. And that, and I share the frustration, I share the sadness, I understand the financial pain those farmers along the Murray are going through, and the Goldwood in Victoria, simply because we haven't had rains that have filled up the dam to the point where general security allocations are available. Minister, how, how, much, how much money has the New South Wales government received from the Commonwealth for monitoring licensing and compliance in the Northern Basin? We can take that on notice. I don't think anyone would have that on notice. But we, you know, we have received significant funds from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has also expended significant funds 
and not helped to, um, to give water literacy to our communities. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of the, 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 the fear campaign that is run by some is based off the fact you can't easily get information. And the Murray-Darling Basin Authority has expended at least $53 million to date and yet haven't got a dashboard, haven't got a clear set of information. So a farmer can go onto a website to find out what water is available for the environment, um, conveyancing water or irrigation allocations, general security, high security water, you know, Commonwealth environmental water, holder water. That should all be available. And if people could see that in a more simpler way across South Australia, Victoria, Queensland and New South Wales, a lot of these gaps in knowledge and information um, would be filled and we could have better conversations and support each other. I, I, yeah, Robert, look, I'm just we're, in, we're in fierce agreement, then why don't you uh, support Helen Dalton's motion to uh, have full declaration, full disclosure and transparency mm -hmm. on the ownership and trading of water? Yeah. Hey, Robert, that's another inquiry. That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, the minister is the that's one that raised inquiry. that issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Can we just... We're going to stick to the... What was that? I know I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Now, Robert, can I, I just want to go to Justin now so we can uh, move around and I'll come back. Yep, Justin. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Minister and team, for being here. I, I did want to try and get into some of the volumes questions quickly. Um, you talk about 1,450 gigalitres of on-farm storage in the, uh, in, these, in the valleys in the north. But the Bow and Darling... Um, uh, review report that the NRC did last year, it talked about 4,000 gigalitres of storage in the upstream valleys from the Bow and Darling. So I'm trying to understand what's correct here because there is different information out there about the volumes of storage in these valleys. I think you broke up a little bit there, um, Mr Field, but the, the New South Wales section of the North the 1,450 gigalitres. Sorry, Minister, you, you also just dropped out there. So did you say 1,450, five zero? On, yep. far, on farm storage in the northern in New South Wales. And that's just, just to clarify from that too, these are large um, irrigation storages in the designated plot plains in the North Basin. So um, you've got to be careful that we're comparing apples to apples. So there's dams for all sorts of purposes. There's farm dams, which are quite prolific all through the north and the south, that those dams can be um, put in place to capture up to 10% pastoral rights in most areas for stock and domestic use. So we just need to be careful when you're comparing um, reports that you know, we're comparing apples with apples, that's all. But that's yeah, what exactly what I'm trying to, to get to, yeah. So you've previously um, said publicly, and I think the department has as well, that um, during the period of, of um, the, uh, uh, the regulation coming in and the embargo being in place and then the temporary lifting, that 30 gigalitres of water was captured at that time uh, in floodplain storages. You're not sure what percentage of that is floodplain harvesting. Is that still the figure you're using? So we've done some satellite imagery uh, and remote sensing and all the figures that we have tell us that about 30 gigalitres of water was, um, there was an increase of 30 gigalitres of water on those on-farm storages in those areas in an approximate week. Um, but that 30 gigalitres is not just from when the floodplain harvesting embargo was lifted, it's also basic landholder rights um, and other pumping so for filling, other reasons. So, so filling, for example, just an, an on-farm stock dam that is incorporated in that 30 gig. So do, do you want to... So the licensing process that's coming into place um, in the next year will um, require people to have um, measurement and metering um, devices in place so it can be better measured. And what's happening now is that it's really showing why we need those measurement um, policies and the licensing in place. So I think we recognise that this is just a transitional period and so there's gaps in the information, but the best available knowledge is that from the images that we've got is that it was about 30 gigalitres um, increase in storage in those few days. Okay, thank you. Justin. Now, the order... One more, Mick, if I could. Um, the order for... 
the order um, to uh, uh, or the, the embargo that was put in place after the regulation seemed to create a distinction between active and passive take. Um, for the purposes of floodplain harvesting policy development, will passive take be considered floodplain harvesting and be required to be licensed? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with some bigger context. So when it, you know, when when it floods or when it rains and water flows over land, it, it's moving everywhere over big, large geographical areas. What we're trying to do with the licensing process is capture that water that used for irrigation and stored for later irrigation. So the water in the big storage dams, in, in effect, um, the water that's out there on the floodplain does lots of other beneficial things. It enters wetlands. It recharges groundwater. It um, it sits on pasture land and grows crop for cattle and sheep. It, 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 it dry supports land dry land cropping, all sorts of other things. So there, there's a lot of water that goes out the floodplain that does a lot of good things that won't ever make its way back to a river because it's supporting other processes. What we're trying to do in the floodplain harvesting licence is, is capture that really big proportion of water that um, it, irrigators um, take from the floodplain and store in large dams for later use for irrigation. So that, I guess that's the broader context I, I, I wanted to start with. Um, you, you're, you're right, so this is the first time that we've uh, regulated this, act, this activity, so we needed to make it, we needed to recognise the landscape that existed prior to being able to condition these works, and that gave rise to this distinction between passive and active take, um, Justin, but into the licensing framework, that, that distinction won't be there. We'll be able to condition these individual works so that they can not take water when they're not allowed to take water in essence, when they've run out of account balance or when there's a restriction. on So this is but a transitional arrangement because we don't yet have full licensing. Once it's a very long-winded answer, but once we get into full licensing, then all of the water will, will be required to be measured. With all of that component that, that that is floodplain harvesting. But I wanted to be really clear with that context at the start that it, it's not every drop of water that goes out in the floodplain. It's that large volume that's extracted and taken from the floodplain and later used for irrigation that we're building into life. Okay, so that's twice in the last five minutes that you've made a distinction about big storages or big storage dams. That seems to be significant. What portion of water used for, I guess, productive uses is captured and stored in a big storage dam versus captured in some other way or held back behind an embankment uh, or a berm, but otherwise used for productive purposes on the floodplain. Yeah, so, so I think in terms of, uh, again, it goes back to what is take and what, what are we trying to regulate under our legal limits that have been set up under New South Wales law and under the Commonwealth law and under the Basin Plan. Um, it isn't water that's being held back behind an embank embankment. That's not a, that those things, those broader landscape changes are things that are more, more loosely termed interception activities under the Basin Plan. As we develop water resource plans, we, we, we need to look at those interception activities, assess the risk of growth in that interception activity and how that might affect both the environment and allocation reliability for other licensed users. And if that risk is large enough, then we need to have mitigation strategies in place to deal with those things. But they're, they're what the Basin Plan calls an, an interception activity. They're not a form of take that we're recognising and trying to licence under our legislation in New South Wales. I think that is where a lot of this frustration is coming from. Other areas, other parts of the community see that very much as floodplain harvesting, and my reading of the definition seems to be that as well. I can't believe that 10 years into this process, we're still arguing about definitions that seem fundamental to the whole regulation of this, of this section of policy. So I think some more context, Justin, as well. There's two bits to the Healthy Floodplains program. There's the licensing of the volumes that we're talking about now. There's also uh, the floodplain management plans that we developed. As I said um, a little bit early on, um, we've got three of those floodplain management plans in place now. One for the Border Rivers, uh, sorry, one for the Guida, one for the Bow and Darling, and one for the Upper Namoi. A floodplain management plan for the Lower Namoi and a floodplain management plan for the Border Rivers are imminent to be commenced. And then we've got our floodplain management plan for the Macquarie Valley. The real purpose of those floodplain management plans is to make sure that development on the floodplain allows water to move through the floodplain landscape unimpeded. That is the that that is the issue that you that you reflect on here is structures blocking water from going to places it would have naturally gone in the floodplain landscape. 
that's what this reform project is looking at doing. Um, certainly for new and amended works through floodplain management plans, they make sure that there are really rigorous, proper, best available information put to the assessment process behind what you can build in the floodplain landscape to make sure that none of those outcomes are compromised. There is, because of, like all things, evolving management of floodplains over time, uh, quite a large number of works in the landscape that, that water and use, uh, sorry, that um, the Natural Resource Access Regulator will need to look at closely and decide whether or not they need to bring those into compliance. They might not be licensed at the moment, and there are some in some valleys of those, and that's a process for the regulator to look at, you know, working through that and bringing those works into compliance. But we, we, we are putting lots of different pieces of the puzzle together to give an overall outcome, if, if, if that helps. And I think um, the process that Dan is talking about really goes to the complexity and the time that it's taken. We're talking about farm by farm assessment, um, and we've also had an independent panel review of this process. Um, I think it just helps um, to really explain why, why it's so difficult and it's taken so long. Yep. Justin. You there, Justin? You've just dropped out. You there? Yeah, mate. I'll hand over to someone else. If we've got time, I'm happy to come back. Okay. Well, just on the time, I uh, have. Uh, I must apologise to the committee. I thought we were going to 4.30. We're actually going to 4.15. So I was giving a bit of latitude where I probably shouldn't have been. Um, so I apologise. Sam is next, then Kate. Thanks, Chair. Sam? I've, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions. Firstly, um, happy for them to direct it to the minister, but happy for either Dan or Emma to answer it. But the government has invested, I think, something like $15 million into improved data collection and modelling, which will actually help implement the policy itself. And from what I've read up on it, it's quite cutting edge. I just wanted to find out just a quick update on where that's up to uh, and how that will actually assist in, in developing this policy or in, in to implement it. Yeah, I'm happy to take that. So um, you're, you're right, so significant amount, amount of money. So 50 million in the whole project, about 15 million in the floodplain harvesting project today. Um, as I said, that's really assisted us in undertaking on ground field surveys, looking at remote sensing, and, and, and then using that stuff to enhance our tools, our floodplain models and our river system models to help inform the generation of entitlements, but also inform future management arrangements as well. Um, we're getting close, I guess, is the, long, is the short story long. If you look in our action plan, we've committed to publicly um, uh, putting out in place two modelling reports, so a model building calibration report that will really go through what's the data sources we've used and how we've gone about reconfiguring models and how do they perform. So those, model, those modelling reports will come out in a valley-by-valley -valley basis. We've got, a, I guess, a companion report to that modelling report, which describes the different development scenarios that we use. So. Uh, 93, 94 development scenario, uh, a 99, 2000 development scenario, an 08 development scenario, and, and a current condition scenario, which is you know, the development on the ground as closely as we can represent it now. So those two reports are, are going to come out. We've committed to those. They'll be, they'll be independently peer reviewed as well um, before they come out. Um, also attached to those, I think interestingly, is a environmental benefits report. So we know there's been growth in some areas of the Northern Basin floodplain harvesting. The licensing process does um, put in place arrangements to address that growth and bring it back in line with those legal limits that set. And that in itself delivers some hydrological benefits, which you know, relate to environmental benefits and downstream benefits. So we've, we're going to some length in being able to describe those sorts of benefits to people as well, both for the benefit of you know, the communities within those valleys, but also the downstream communities as well. So we've committed to doing that. You can expect to see the first of those reports, peer reviewed reports, starting to come out in the second half of this year, but uh, for all valleys between sort of in the next six months or so, um, Sam. So um, it, it, it's all yet to come. Process is outlined in the action plan. Excellent. Thank you. Second question is uh, to the minister, I think, um, but happy if, if you wanted to get someone from the department, but I think it's um, in line to ask you that the Water Management Act outlined that rainfall is floodplain harvesting. So I asked the question earlier um, from Mr. Brooks from the Southern Riverina Irrigators about farms in the Murray and that they required to capture rainfall and whether they think that's plain, a, a, a floodplain harvesting. And it was, I think his response was along the lines that he, he doesn't believe it is. What, what is your view on that? Uh, and I, mean, I, I you mentioned it earlier as well. I just wanted to follow up on that. 
I think, um, Mr Faraway, the best way to answer that is to actually hand it to the experts so I can't accuse the being political. Um, and, and I think the facts need to be dealt with those that aren't uh, the politicians here in the room. Yeah, so, so Fine Pine Harvesting is, is really um, any water on the, the landscape, so it, it comes really following heavy rain, water breaks out rivers and creeks and sort of floods the landscape. That's the typical type of flood pine harvesting, but it can also occur following heavy rain. So we've had just in the recent event in February, for example, uh, that, that event wasn't driven by flooding in the rivers. It came from heavy rainfall on the flood pine that then made its way into the rivers and creeks. So anywhere that there are works that can intercept rainfall, or flooding from rivers, and, and they exist statewide, there's flood pine harvesting. So that's the, just the simple answer. Yep, that's a far more accurate answer than I got earlier. Another question, the best information I've got about virtual site visits, my own on-farm visits, the department briefings and everything we've done today is that the Northern Basin in itself has had zero allocation for four years. We've had a lot of people refer to the fact that the Southern Basin haven't had an allocation in a long time, and no one has mentioned that there's actually been one of if, if the most severe drought uh, in recent memory. Um, I asked in, uh, in the submission from Mr. Brooks earlier about uh, his claim that the, the Northern Irrigators basically have all their water storage is full. And I asked him to be able to demonstrate how he can uh, prove that. And he referred, to, um, he referred to his light plane that he used and some satellite imaging and, and, and a report. Now I have asked for that uh, as a question on notice to come back with that information, but I cannot find where um, in the site visits, in briefings, in any where these northern basin water storage facilities are full. I gather you're asking that to the minister, Sam. Uh, yeah, well, I'll direct it to the minister. Yeah, but I'm happy for yeah. Publicise the answer by giving it to a professional public servant who um, is able to more accurately, accurately um, ascertain uh, our work to see how how full those storages actually are. So, I'd just like to give a bit of context to the committee. So. From 2017 until the rain in early 2020, Northern Inland New South Wales was experiencing their worst drought on record. So the water bodies dried and contracted, water became scarce, and rivers stopped flowing in many parts um, of the state. In fact, unregulated. Um, un unregulated, of course. And many regional towns and villages had to rely on um, water carting. Um, uh, your, um, water quality had deteriorated and many irrigators up north in these unregulated areas had limited or no access to water for extended periods. We had irrigators um, tell us that they hadn't been able to take any water for three years. So how it works um, in the unregulated areas in the north is if the water doesn't get, regardless of what they've got in their accounts, that almost becomes irrelevant. If the water doesn't get above a certain flow, which we call the commence to pump or the cease to pump, they cannot legally take water, even if they've got hundreds of gigalitres um, in their account. So because of those really terrible drought conditions, and in fact, we had to trigger our extreme events policy, and so many areas were in, um, you know, um, I think levels four and five, so, um, which is terrible extreme um, drought conditions. Towns were running out of water. Um, the government actually passed some legislation to enable um, critical water supply for, for towns to, be, um, to get approval to... Um, and I might just cut in there. Yeah. I mean, one of the towns that we were most challenged and threatened with was Tenderfield. Tenderfield is the top of the Great Dividing Range. There's no extraction, there's no irrigation up there. It just showed how it hadn't rained for three years, which is putting enormous pressure on the sector. That wasn't the, the fault of the productive farming sector. That was just simply a lack of rain. Uh, that's right. So I think it would be uh, hard to believe that the um, irrigators in that area had full storages um, at that point. And just um, an, an example of how bad it was, and the embargo that we put in place, um, one, of the, um, one of the benefits of it was, was that we actually 
fill the town um, wear supplies for 10 towns um, along the Bow and Darling, which is a combined total population of 13,000. So these were towns that were having to rely on groundwater um, because their town water supplies, their usual town water supplies, um, were um, severely degraded. Yep. So, so okay. just, quick, just to jump in, obviously, Emma, you, you've been talking about the unregulated, which I, I get, um, and then obviously versus the regulated system. But it's fair to say from what the research I've done um, that the regulated systems have not had an allocation in the Northern Basin for four years. So a claim, you know, and putting it all in context about floodplain harvesting and, and um, that, that they've had rain, that they've had water, that they've had allocation in the South have, isn't not, that's not necessarily correct over the last four years, is it? It's that the North haven't actually had an allocation for several years. Yeah, that, that it's at least two years, um, but it could be longer than that. Remembering four years ago in 2016, all the dams were full, everything was swimmingly. But then we've actually had you know, a critical shortage of rain until this event in February, which has fallen in the far west, but we're yet to still fill our major catchments, even in the community of Sackers, where you are, I think, speaking from, Mr. Barraway. Um, but yes, there hasn't been uh, allocations to much of the system, certainly since I've been there. So yeah. just, okay, just, just, just finally, I've just got one more, then I'm finished. Um, and I wanted to touch on, Minister Pavey, your opening remarks. I posed a question to Aqualaw, Tim from Aqualaw earlier today about a research I'd been doing, and there was quite a lot of commentary in The Guardian around uh, unmeasured floodplain harvesting and, and, and by irrigators. You mentioned that you had a document, which I have not been privy to, but you said you had a document that you said that had been edited in terms of their commentary in the media on, on floodplain harvesting. Is that correct? Look, I'm happy to table the document. It came to my attention. It was forwarded um, to yep. my team. It was circulated around um, uh, people within the, the irrigation um, industry. And it was clear that, uh, that the lawyers were proof or fact-checking a story that would be prepared by The Guardian. So very interesting alliance. Um, and there was work that was being done by that law firm. Well, to, um, okay. What, 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 what I might do, Mr. Chair, just, but based on time, because time. I know you want to move on, I might put that as a question on notice for Minister Pavian uh, to table it if, um, if she could, because I think that, That's good. Um, we'll do that answers my question as well from earlier. Excellent. We'll, we'll do with that. Okay, Kate. Thanks, Mick. Thanks, Chair. Sorry. Um, Minister, I just wanted to get back to this legal advice that I think has been um, talked about before. So I understand that you have talked to Parliament and stressed the fact that uh, I think in your words that floodplain harvesting is um, an activity that is completely legal. Is that basically what you've been saying? I said in Parliament uh, to a question from the member for Murray, it was legal. Um, and that was the advice that I'd had from my agency. Um, and it is something that has been um, operating within, uh, the, the, within New South Wales for, for decades. Um, and I think it might be appropriate at this point to Pastor Dan or Emma. Well, just before, to, before you do, sorry, it's just, just about to... that advice. It's That's just to have. Advice. But no, I think that they have been asked about this re request before by another member of this committee. So the question is to you, Minister, because you relied on this advice in Parliament to a question. So clearly you have seen this advice. I was given advice that, uh, that it was an activity that was covered in the 1912 Water Act, and that is what I said. Parliament. Who is the advice from? That, that, that created, um, if you want to say, put the rabbit amongst the hares. Um, I'm going to refer to Mr O'Connor and Ms Solomon to talk to the issue um, of the minute taking that has created this conspiracy that it's not legal. Thanks. So um, I'm aware of the minutes that the Minister is referring to and and have, have reviewed them. And it, um, what the minutes reflect is some, I would call some sloppy shorthand, um, uh, slop, sloppy short, um, shorthand 
from um, uh, the officers uh, at that meeting and clearly doesn't take into context or it's not recorded um, in the meeting minutes um, everything that has been said earlier um, at the hearing today uh, in this session, which is that floodplain works have had to be regulated under the 1912 Act since 1983. I think it's in that context um, that the Minister um, asked the Parliament know that it was legal under the 1912 Act. So can I just ask, so if Therefore, just for clarification, so um, essentially, though, what these uh, meeting minutes say is that if you don't have basic rights or license or an exemption, there is no ability to legally take water. Is that correct or is that false? Minister? What's your advice say? Been advised, your question was whether floodplain harvesting is legal, and my advice no, has been to my question just then. Sorry, but it's a different question now. This is based on the meeting minutes I have before me that I think uh, Emma may have said is sloppy shorthand or something. But this says if you don't have basic rights or a license or an exemption. There is no ability to legally take water, yes or no? The issue is of those minutes that you are quoting, they were taken in a way down that, was, um, that wasn't accurate to all the other information that was going on in the meeting and all the other information that is in that meeting. We are going through a very difficult process and the first part of that process was putting a regulation in place uh, to prohibit uh, the floodplain harvesting during that first flush event in February. We are working through these processes and my point is that there are people that are, are, are blaming the North for not having any general security allocations, not putting into context the amount of water that hasn't fallen in the catchment of the Murray system. Um, my, my, my position and my answer is that the advice I have if it is legal and we are going through a very proper process uh, to ensure that we fully measure it, and that is what we are working through. Minister, was the purpose of this regulation just to give legality to floodplain structures that have never been through a licensing or approvals process? No. Now, just a question, that? just a quick question to... Um, just a quick question to Dan Connor, if I may. Dan, I have an email that uh, is in front of me. It's from you sent on the 16th of January, 2020. Obviously, there was a bunch of documents that were um, uh, revealed through um, the call for papers in the upper house. And this email suggests that um, you say, that should a floodplain harvesting event occur prior to the exemption being put in place, then there will be considerable uncertainty for irrigators about whether or not they can take legal, whether they can take, whether they can legally take water. So the minister seems to be so sure that this is all legal based on the advice that's coming from somewhere that nobody can actually kind of talk about, yet here's an email from you saying that uh, irrigators will, there will be considerable uncertainty as to whether they can legally take water. So I'll just, what's your response firstly to that email then? Was that sloppy writing from you there as well, or are there, are there a few strange things going on here? No, so that, that, that's, that, that's accurate and in my view, not, not inconsistent. So we've said all the way through here that um, and it's been foreshadowed since 2013 that these, these are transitional arrangements that are necessary to bridge the gap between where we were under the Water Act and where we need to be under the Water Act. Um, but what does that uh, gap, what is that gap? That's gaps that in approvals, is, isn't it? There is indeed uncertainty and that's what we, that's what we sought to put in place. It's in, I guess it's in everybody's interest, in irrigators' interest, in downstream stakeholders' interest to have clear rules and certainly as we've talked about, we've had an independent, we've got an independent regulator now and, and 
and indeed in that context the independent regulator was was talking to us about what they saw as and, I, and i've heard this um mentioned at, at some of the discussions this morning with the northern irrigator groups there, there was um there, there there is a view and it certainly is the the remit of a regulator to, to let us know as the, the rule makers where the rules are not clear enough for them to be able to take the enforcement action that they would need to have. And so certainly the regulator identified here, as we had for some time, that there was some ambiguity in the rules and that we needed sure. to be clear about those rules, as, as had been foreshadowed since 2013. In the Thank you. Policy. I've got two more quick questions. Sorry, Mick. But does yeah. so you keep talking about uncertainty, Minister, doesn't uncertainty just mean that there's there is floodplain harvesting that falls through the cracks, if you like, of approvals, exemptions and licensing, and therefore it's illegal? And if it's not, two questions. One, that it's illegal. And if it's not, will you please table the advice for the committee that you are relying upon the legal advice, which could perhaps end all this conflict between the northern and southern um, irrigators for starters. So if you're so certain about this, please table the advice, which would be extremely helpful for the committee. But firstly, does uncertainty mean basically illegal works? I'm oh, happy to provide information um, to the committee um, and the advice that uh, is prolific through the agency talking to the issue that um, floodplain harvesting has been a recognised illegal activity for some time. Happy to do that. Um, but I also, uh, I just wanted to talk about something. Oh no, I'll, I'll let you finish your questions, Kate. I just wanted to say something. Can I, just before you do, Kate, sure. just to be clear, Minister, sure. Kate was asking. Yeah, okay. It was asking for the legal advice to be tabled just for the committee members. Is that what? And you're saying that that's what you will do? She asked for advice, and I'm happy to provide advice showing that it's a an activity. You did ask for advice, and I'm legal happy to advice. provide advice you have that talks to the issue of floodplain harvesting. I think it was legal advice, but I could be wrong, Kate. Your I turn. think the question, Minister, very clearly is: Have you seen legal advice that suggests? that flood bank, all floodplain harvesting is legal, like you said in the chamber, I think, last uh, few months ago. What it, have you seen? Sorry. I'm happy to take that on notice in relation to, and I think Ms Solomon answered a question in relation to, to legal privilege, but I am happy to provide advice that I have received over time from my agency that says that floodplain harvesting is a legal activity since the 1912 Act. So I'm happy to provide that advice. In terms of legal advice, I'll take that on notice. Okay, thank you. One, one last Kate. question, Mick, if, if the minister, sorry, if the minister does take it on notice to see whether she has that legal advice, would she table it if she has it? Yeah. I will take that on notice in relation to legal advice, but I'm happy to provide other advice to the committee showing that it is a process that is appropriate. Yep. Thank okay. Um, Justin's got a question. Thanks, uh, Chair. It was largely follow up to, to that. I, mean, I think there's still a lack of clarity here. If the regulation, if you've received advice that floodplain harvesting is appropriate or legal under 1912, however word you just used, what were the issues that were clarified by the regulation? Minister? It was putting a context, it was putting an authorization around a process to ban it. That was what we were doing, Emma. So, um, thanks. I might just give um, a bit more answer to that question. So, what the um, regulation did enabled um, it gave um, water users who had the approvals um, and who um, the infrastructure constructed prior to 2008, 3rd of July 2008, it gave them some certainty that what they were doing was legal. And it also made it, it set that date in stone. So after 3rd of July 2008, the um, infrastructure or works 
that wasn't approved legal. So what it actually did was reduce um, a piece of work um, from which people could um, obtain harvest from. Sorry, Chair, I missed a little bit of that. I don't know if you heard yeah. it all at your end. You know, at the end there, can I just say, Emma, at the end, you, you just faded away again, probably the last couple of sentences. So the regulation did two things. It gave um, water users confidence that if they were using works that was prior to 3rd of July 2008, that those works could be used for floodplain harvesting activities. And for works from 3rd of July 2008, it said that they could only be used if they had um, approvals under the legislation that's listed in the regulation. So what the regulation does is it actually confines or restricts the, um, the number of people or number of properties where floodplain harvesting can legally take place. So it doesn't expand it, it actually restricts it because of that line in the sand of 3rd of July 2009. Okay. All sides um, of whether they're in the right or in the wrong. And it also um, gives confidence to NRA, the independent regulator, um, about those dates as well. Okay. okay, last question. Okay. If you don't conclude your policy by the middle of 2021 for the five northern basins, uh, how, what, what happens to this regulation? Does it just continue and essentially provide an ongoing exemption for floodplain harvesting in those valleys? So um, I, I can answer that, Justin. So um, what we've got set up under our around this a little bit as well. What we've got set up under our water sharing plans is that floodplain harvesting is part of the extraction limit that we've set up. It's part of the legal limits of what we're trying to do is to give effect to licensing to make sure that floodplain harvesting doesn't grow and exceed those limits. Make sure that everyone can be shared. I guess the end result of being able to license an activity and it being exempt is that it continues to grow. And then that growth under our legal limits needs to be offset by a reduction in something else. So it's a bit like me speeding down the highway and you getting it, you getting a fine. It's a pretty inequitable solution. That's the that's the way our legislation is set up at the moment. That's the requirements under the basin plan as well. The basin plan doesn't say you need to license every everything, but it it, it does make sure that if things aren't licensed and they grow, that you have a mechanism to be able to offset that growth to make sure that the the outcome overall for the valley is the same level of consumptive take. So I, I wanted to assure you that. Uh, we, we've got every intention of being able to deliver this project by 30 June 2021, but there, there are arrangements, and, and I'm happy to talk to that as well, but there are arrangements set up in a plan that means that downstream users and communities aren't shortchanged as a result of you know, us, us unable to deliver this. And well, just they, already the don't believe about, your, they, they already don't believe the volume. Okay, so I'm not okay, sure that's going to happen, but that doesn't answer the question at all. Does the regulation just continue just if the policy doesn't get finalised? Justin, uh, we are now out of time. Uh, so can I just say, um, so there was a the suggestion there that like, there was a suggestion at the end of the question, the answer there that uh, it would be tabled, the remainder that would be tabled. If we could make sure that happens as a question on notice, that would be good. Um, uh, I had a series of questions, but because I, uh, this is a technical political term, because I stuffed up the timing, I'm gonna put all of my questions on notice, Minister, that relate to NRA and uh, the communication process. And, uh, and so essentially that draws us to a close today. Um, I wanna thank, can I sorry, Minister. Refer, I just wanna make a clarification on something if I can, Mr. Chair. Um, in relation to the 30 gigalitre, I'm just looking at some correspondence on Twitter. I just wanna make it very clear for Mr. Field that the 30 gigalitre is active and passive. I think it's a very important fact to be able to get those facts right instead of misleading the community. Well, let's ask the question about whether it's a big damn storage or interception, okay. perhaps, Minister. Then we'll have more yeah. clarity, okay. won't we? Okay, folks, that's it. It's all over Red Rover. Making okay. it up as you go. And uh, questions on notice. So, Minister, if there were any questions on notice, uh, the committee's resolved 14 days for a turnaround of response. Um, and there may be some questions from um, committee members. There will be from me. Uh, so, uh, again, the 14 days. The committee secretariat will be in touch with you about all of that and uh, I thank you all very much for your attendance and I know members other committee members are dashing off now to another committee
So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mick.